<laughs> I lived in England. I went to a girl's birthday party, and Harry happened to be there. And what happened? And we danced. We danced. We danced, and we had a very surreal conversation where he told me that he had a poster of me on his wall when he was a kid. <laughs> What? Ned, how are you? I'm well, thank you. I think we talked last time because of Scream, and then we talked before about something else, but you came in. Mm -hmm. But this is a different way to talk to you. This is your first time coming to TIFF. As a producer. Yeah, on the other side of the camera. What's that been like for you? Really nice. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, because I don't have to worry about, like, criticism of my performance. or (laughs) (laughs) No, to be honest, I... I like being behind the scenes. I like the creative process. I like, you know, working with other minds and it not being about just the performance, but about sort of the essence of the project that you're creating and why you're creating it and what it means and forming it. I love that process. So I'm enjoying it. It's different than producing something that you don't have anything to do with. Yeah. This is in some ways still feels personal to me. Very much so for me. Can you tell us a little bit about your your history with ballet? It's your first love, right? My first love, yeah. And I started dancing when I was six. And by the time I was nine, I went to National Ballet School. And uh, I was there for five years. And, um, you know, dance was my first career. Uh, So when uh, Chelsea McMillan, the director of this, and Sean O'Neill, our other filmmaker, uh, approached me a year and a half ago and asked me whether I would want to be a part of a project that was bringing light to the National Ballet of Canada, but also to Karen Kane um, for her swan song, for her to direct a Swan Lake on the National Ballet as her goodbye. I was like, do you really understand? Do you have any idea <laughs> the connection here? Karen Kane was my idol growing up. I am an artist in a big part because of her. I remember being nine years old and sitting on the edge of my seat watching her do Swan Lake. I remember it viscerally, clearly. And I remember thinking, oh, you can story tell. You can story tell through your body. You can tell a story and and have an entire audience be enraptured and be moved. No words. No words. No words. No words. Just movement, yeah. She was incredible, and I was like, this, this, is, this is my dream, this is what I want, and, and the power of not just dance, but storytelling. Um, yeah, really moved me. And my, my dad is a super numerary for the company. Like He goes on as basically background performer for the company. My stepmother has been a part of the ward, a wardrobe coordinator was for 35 years of the company. Like I'm so attached to this yeah. <laughs> story yeah. in so many ways um, that it was just so perfect. I felt kismet. What was that like being nine and going to the National Ballet School? Amazing. I mean, I didn't really know what it was when uh, my teacher at the time, I was at Erinvale School of Dance in Mississauga, yeah. and in, which was in the basement behind a swimming pool in the community center behind our house growing up. And she said, you know, you've got something. You've got something. She actually said it to my dad. And she said, she should really audition for National Ballet School. He didn't know what it was. She gave yeah. us a brochure. I remember the brochure. I remember looking at it and thinking, oh, I have to wear a uniform. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I remember auditioning for the school. It was my first audition experience. And I remember starting there. And The discipline. I mean, the school, they start early in the morning and it's all through the, it's all day long. You're dancing and doing academics. Kids, your kids. Your kids. Yeah, little kids. And people, kids move away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People live there. Yeah. I lived there for a few years. Yeah. Um, And it's your entire life, you know, but you're also getting the greatest training in the world. Like one top three, let's say the National Ballet of Canada is top three in ballet companies in the world. The school certainly first or second um so you were really lucky you know really lucky to get a place and um to get that kind of training um 
yeah, it was great. It was hard. I also was struggling physically. I just had a lot of injuries from very early. And the National is great. The company and the school are great. They have physiotherapy. They have yeah. teams of people in place for, for injury. Um, and I was with the physiotherapist at nine years old already, every week, to the point where I was in there so much, I was doing ultrasound on the other kids. <laughs> <laughs> you were getting trained yeah, in ballet. I literally was thinking, maybe I'll be a physio. <laughs> 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 maybe I'd enjoy that more. Um, but I loved dancing. But but, but the, the competitiveness um, and, the, you know, the comparison that you do of yourself and how hard you can become on yourself can be quite trying at that age. Um, and I found it really, I found it very difficult. Um, can I ask why uh, yeah. you left? For that reason. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, I, had the in, I had injuries. I was struggling with my body. But I also just had that thing of, like, um feeling like it had become so much about the discipline and, and so much about work, and I'd lost sort of my love for it, love for the movement um, and the storytelling. I've sort of come to terms, come to peace with a lot of my old dance stuff. You know, yeah. I got to make this movie about dance, which I can't say the name of because of the sex strike right now. But Oh, is that so? Yeah. Okay, I have some questions about it later. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, right. but you can talk about it, but I can't okay, like, say the name of good it. Good enough. Um, okay. You know, in making that project, that really helped me exercise my need to figure out my trauma around dance yeah. and my need to dance and, and my need to prove myself as that as well. Um, so I feel like I was able to let any of the negative stuff go um, back then. And in watching this now, yeah, it triggered me. <laughs> I mean, I look at these dancers, and I'm like, oh, poor young me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also understand their drive and their passion. Like, if you have to do it, you have to do it. You can't not do it. I was wondering whether there was like sense memory, like did these. Oh yeah, even when I I used to, when I had had the injuries and I'd moved into acting and I hadn't done that film yet, I I couldn't listen to classical music. Oh wow! Well. Literally couldn't listen to classical music because I would just fall because of what that does to me and my memories and my body. And, and all of everything. a sudden you're going back into the National Ballet and you're smelling all those things. Oh, and saying, yeah. Oh, this, everything. Know. Just the boxes of rosin and the pink tights, the tights and the outfits and the hair and the, I don't know, the smell of backstage and wings and the whole shebang. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you talked a little bit about Karen Kane there and I'm glad you talked about your experience with it. Mm -hmm. um, because maybe that was one of my favorite parts of the film. It was so fascinating to see the dancers when Karen would come around and write them. Mm they would be in awe I of know. her and kind of afraid of her. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? She held a lot of power. Yeah. A lot, held and she's all, an icon. All the power. Yeah. You know, and she was an icon. Imagine being Karen and being in that place. Yeah. To walk into a room and know that everyone is a little bit scared and that you hold their entire careers, their entire careers in your hand. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's so a big burden. It sounds like that's something you were interested in as well, not just the impact of that power, but the, if the holding of, of the power Of what itself. that is for her. To, and also to go from being prima ballerina and moving so gracefully into taking over this company and running it. Um, but also I was interested in the challenges of it. And she's so humble. You know, what I love about this is you get to watch this person that we all admire be at a loss at moments and you realize, oh, she's just an artist. Yeah. She's an artist who's trying to find it and trying to figure figure out what this and she's not sure. She's she's got insecurity. And then she finds it. She figures it out. And that's what makes a great artist is a person who's not afraid to sort of fall on their face, make mistakes, be daring. You know, she she made the choice in this film, it was very important to her that the dancers not wear tights, not wear pink tights to raise the issue of racism in the ballet world. Talk, talk a little bit yeah. more about that. Well, it's mostly white. It's always, it's been white, you know, um, for centuries. Um, and that needed to shift. And the company is very diverse, actually. But what hasn't shifted was the fact that these dancers, even in Swan Lake, it's a very old school traditional mm -hmm. ballet, are all wearing pink tights. Mm -hmm. They're even using wet wipe to wipe down their skin, which is not right. Mm -hmm. It's not right. hasn't been right. certainly can't be the case now. Um, and it was important to her that the dancers be represented fully as themselves and their, their beauty, their, their beautiful skin, their beautiful selves, you know, so... Um, and to bring that up, to raise that and point it out, I think was brave. 
How was it getting to spend time with her for you? Oh, my God. <laughs> when did you meet her first? Um, well, I first met her when I was nine. Okay. Walking behind her. She had been at the National Ballet School. I don't know why. And I was walking about 20 feet behind her. I had my bun, my hair in a bun. Yeah. I had my school uniform on. And I was like, oh, my God. She's walking like this. Pigeon footed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a duck. Um, <laughs> and, and I just was so uh, following her. And at some point, she stopped at the light, and she turned around, and she said, do you want to talk to me? <laughs> oh, like, that's so sweet. I don't sweet. even remember what I said. I don't know what I said, to be honest. But she was very sweet to me for that moment. And I remember getting on the subway after, and being like, oh, Karen, can you talk to me? Oh, my God. <laughs> she signed some point shoes for me once, oh. and I held those in my room for many decades. And, and now you got to spend some time with her making this thing. Today, I spent the whole day with her doing press, and it's so surreal for me. It's so surreal. Ma- I mean, magic, honestly. It's, I was saying to my kids yesterday, I was like, you guys, can you imagine, like, think of, I can't name anybody, like, for, for my son, Messi, you know. So just imagine if you got to spend the day with Messi. That's mm-hmm. what it's going to be like for me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, wow. <laughs> but like you said, the, the most beautiful thing about, and I've got to talk to her a couple of times, mm-hmm. thank God, is um, that you're right. If she was a god, if mm-hmm. she was this unfallible figure, mm-hmm. You're right. One of the great things the documentary does is shows that she struggles too, and yeah. she's an, she doesn't have all the right answers too. Yeah, she is a master, but we only get there from doing hard work and doing the work to find to find the thing. Mm-hmm. You know, she obviously always pushed, pushed, pushed till she would get there, and she did again. So this is the 20th anniversary of The Company, mm. a film about um, a young ballet dancer at the Joffrey Ballet Company in Chicago, directed by Robert Altman. You came up with the story of that film you produced and starred in it. What is it about ballet you think makes for good storytelling? I think we're all ways enamored by athleticism, artistry. But I think it's just humanity, isn't it? It's, it's seeing someone challenge themselves and overcome Um hardship, whether it's physical hardship, mental hardship, um, accomplishing something, creating something beautiful, creating something that that communicates. Um, and also, it's just this weird world over there that so many people know nothing about. Yeah. I think that's interesting, too, right? Because um, it, for a long time, was only for a certain kind of audience, you know? And, and now we're trying to pull it out of that, that that old school (laughs) world and uh, bring it to a bigger audience and have people appreciate. And, you know, contemporary dance has done that and modern dance has done that. The the fact that these companies now can't just do, no one one would pay attention to the National Ballet if they were just doing classical ballets. Mm. Wasn't it also a shift in perception for you? I mean, Party of Five had just ended and um, we thought the screen movies were over. We were wrong, but Mm. we thought there was was (laughs) no more screen movies. And uh, that, 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 Project, I I can say it, right? The the company was, um, I think it was you being seen in a more serious light. light. Mm -hmm. What did you learn through making that about public perception of of an actor based on their previous work? Um, Do you know what I mean? I I do know what you mean, and I try not to think about public perception. Oh, yeah? Because I think it won't help me. I think if I think about public perception, I'll be afraid to try anything new. Did you know know? that then? I think for whatever reason, even from when I was young, I wanted to try new things. I wanted to play characters that I hadn't been seen in before. I I didn't feel that I didn't desire to stay safe um, in what people loved me for. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I desired to expand as an actor to grow, to challenge myself, to see if I could do it, not yeah. do it. I don't read reviews. Yeah. Um, it won't help me. <laughs> uh, because then I'll get scared. Yeah. You know? And it's the same for now. You know, I've optioned some books, and I want to. really want to pursue doing more producing. I would love to direct at some point. So I want to start sort of brainstorming on what that might look like. Um, but, yeah, I try not to think about public perception. It's only, uh, yeah, it's only going to hurt you. I think that's why I don't spend a lot of time in social media or anything. Me too. I know. I find it really tough. I find sometimes that I want, um, if I want to feel bad at, like, if I want the mean voices that are in my head. Go read what people are saying about you. (laughs) Go read what people are saying. You know what I mean? Yeah, but they're not true. Yeah, no. (laughs)
But did you, um, I guess I asked, did, did you know that then? But was it, a, was it, I know you wanted to tell that story, but was it also you going like, hey, look, I'm more than what you might yeah. think of me? Yeah, I mean, I certainly knew that I had been sort of stuck in a, I had been typecast in a way. Oh, yeah. Because, not, not that the TV show was, the character was so identical to the big film, you know, franchise that I was known for, but... Um, that I was just so known. They were so like so iconic those roles apparently, um, that I wanted to make sure that I could be perceived as something else, you know. But only because I want not because I cared what people think, but because I wanted to make sure that there was space for me. Yeah. To keep trying new things. To make the that, that I would you have those opportunities that yeah. and that I could create those opportunities for myself. I have one more. I have a clip I want to play. Okay. The way this business is now, this the, the film industry is now, it's a completely different animal than it even was five years ago. You know, what we dealt with, with, um, you know, the threat of the actor's strike and then September 11th, you know, where the studios five years ago were fearful of making challenging movies or different movies, they're even more so now. So for me to make a project that I like or something that means something to me, I feel like I have to go forward and try and do it on my own. How about that, hey? Wow. So that's you 20 years ago talking wow. about the difficulties in getting that project off the ground. Yeah. I mean, swap out 9-11 for COVID <laughs> and you could be saying the same thing today, <laughs> except that act actors actually are on strike yeah. this time. Yeah. As someone, well, actually, let me just, what, what was your reaction to hearing that just then? It's just, it's fascinating that here we are in another similar situation, you know, there's still challenges in this industry. Um, we're all still struggling to sort of figure out how to work in this business and create new things despite studios um, and limitations. Um, and here I am still talking about sort of wanting to make sure I don't get limited. So at least I'm staying on track. Yeah. Does it, uh, uh, can you still be hopeful that there is room for storytelling like that these days? I can, because here we are. We, we got to make this film, which was great. Um, There are still challenges. I, you know, we've definitely moved into t the TV world is where most of the storytelling is now. I think film, I think we're all aware that film-wise it's very challenging, you know. Um, it hasn't gotten easier. It didn't, you know, when, where it became limited, the amount of films each studio was making, that hasn't really changed. And now it's so much like uh, big superhero films or um, remakes or... Um, franchises a uh, uh, known IP and stuff like yeah, that yeah known IP yeah. yeah but I don't know I I try not I still I guess if I were really to go deep I would probably throw out the books I just bought <laughs> and think oh it's impossible but I think you just have to get past that you know the impossible the feeling of impossible I think you just have to put one foot in front of the other and keep trying until someone actually says no <laughs> yeah, the books you just bought, meaning the... Uh, I just optioned a few books that I want to develop. Oh, see, I'm, I'm so uh, rural. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder what book she went down to. Oh. <laughs> she went down to Indigo? I wonder what she picked up. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't oh. clear. Um, but be, because I want to, you know, uh, tell some stories that I think are interesting and, and may not be out there. Um, so I'm going to keep trying. I um And let me know if you don't want to talk about this. Okay. When I was... Um, when I when I Googled Nev Campbell dance yeah. to get ready for this interview, I came across this story about you that I didn't know. Okay. Uh -oh. About that you and I would never normally ask about it, but I do find it funny. <laughs> that you dance you got invited to the to the UK to like maybe Buckingham Palace. Did you dance oh. with Harry? Yeah. Um, I was not invited to Buckingham Palace. What's the story? I was not invited. I lived in England. Well, you crashed it, did you? No. <laughs> I lived in England. I went to a girl's birthday party, and Harry happened to be there. And what happened? And we danced. We danced. We danced, and we had a very surreal conversation where he told me that he had a poster of me on his wall when he was a kid. <laughs> like, what? What did you make of that? <laughs> I mean, what do you make of that? <laughs> like... How does that? Where at Buckingham Palace? You had a what? Like, how does that compute? 
Or maybe it was just a line, too. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know what? That's not a bad... Yeah, Betty's tried that one on before. You know, you, you know I had a I had pill poster of you. But the queen saw it every day. Yeah, yeah, right, right. What was that like for you? Surreal. Yeah. Weird. Weird. And I met him a couple times after that, too. But, um, yeah, those was one of those just crazy moments where you're like, oh, my life is a little nuts, a little unlike other lives. I love it. Yeah. I also love that he gave it a shot. I know. <laughs> Can't blame him for trying. No. Um, did making this film change your relationship with dance? Did it make you want to dance again? Did it make you feel differently about the the art form? Every time I watch dance, I like I if I listen to music, if I listen to classical music, I see choreography. I I dream choreography sometimes. It's so very much a part of my being. Um, that there's no way for me to sort of shut myself off from it when I'm observing it. Um, but I do at the same time look at, at these dancers and go, oh gosh, poor young me, I remember. And it was hard and good for them. But I'm glad I'm not doing it. <laughs> 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 I'm glad I found something else. But I get it. Like I get, I get the addiction of it. I get the need for perfection. I get the need to move. I get the need to express. I get that urge they have to accomplish and get better and better and better. Because um, you're never perfect, so it's kind of addictive. Like, am I going to do triple today pirouette? Am I going to do quadruple yeah. pirouette? And it changes daily. And maybe that's a beautiful lesson, too, is that sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And you just, every day you still go in. Nev Campbell, thanks for coming in and talking to me about this. I really love the film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.